morning, church. Thank you for joining us this morning. My prayer is that uh, during all this craziness that you guys are well, that uh, the, uh, I know the Lord is with you and uh, he's with all of us. And so let's stand to our feet if we're able and let's uh, lift our voices if we're able. Let's shout aloud these praises to the Lord. What can wash away my sins? Sing it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other founts I know. For my part in this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus, God of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other founts I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Sing, this is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me one. the blood of Jesus. Sing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. truth the life who is the holy word of light who is the vision to our eyes who is the love that will abide only Jesus only Jesus who is true is life only Jesus Christ only Jesus, only Jesus, who is lifted high, only Jesus Christ, who is the purpose of our days, who is our hope that doesn't fade, who is our courage and our strength. Fullness of our faith. Only Jesus, only Jesus, who is true is life. Only Jesus Christ, only Jesus, only. 
Church, our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 14 through 16. It says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Sing this song once torn and beaten, left without reason. To move on, then you reach down and brought me up from the valley of dry bones. Oh, you were the God that saves, you were the one that rescues me. Song of victory, 
Good morning, Hollywood Community Church. We are glad that you have joined us online for worship this morning. We are truly honored and blessed that you and your family are watching with us. We want to let you know if you are watching, we would encourage you to, to fill out our online attendance form. You can find it on our website at ourhcc.org. Just look for online attendance form, fill it out because we would love to know who's watching with us. If this is your first time joining us online, we want to say welcome. We are glad that you are here, but we'd also like to know you were watching with us. And so you would can fill out a connect card on our website at the same website, rhcc.org, find connect card, click on that, fill it out. And we would love nothing more than to reach out to you this coming week and say, how can we pray for you? How can we love on you? And how can we help you take your next steps in following Jesus? For those of you that are sitting back saying, you know what, I would love to come back and worship in person live, but I haven't been comfortable yet. And you're thinking, maybe I'll come back on June 21st. Well, here's what we want you to do. We want you to register for that service as well. So if you're saying, okay, I didn't want, I'm not comfortable coming this week, but I'll come next week. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to click on the registration link on Monday morning. On Monday morning, you can click on register here for the live service on our website, and you will be able to access the registration form. You'll be able to submit it and reserve your spot for the 21st. So if that's you, make sure Monday morning, go to our website and click on the registration for the live service. We want to thank each of you that have been faithful in your tithes and offerings. Everything that we've been able to do during this whole pandemic, our online community, our live service communities, everything with the food pantry, it is because you have chosen to sacrificially give. And we are so grateful and thankful for each of you. You are demonstrating the love of Christ. And we are amazed and in awe of what you guys have been doing. So thank you from the leadership at HCC. There's several different ways that you can continue to be faithful in your tithes and offerings. You can give through the mail. You can give through our website at rhcc.org. You could also use our text to give option where you text the number, the amount you'd like to give, and you'll be able to stay faithful that way. You can also use our church app just by opening the app and clicking it on the give tab, and you will be able to give in that way as well. So thank you for your sacrifice and thank you for your giving heart. Before we continue in worship, would you please pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, we pray right now that uh, your name would be lifted up and glorified. Father, we pray that you would change our hearts, continue to mold us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, that we would truly be your hands and feet and show the world the good news of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for those of us that might be watching, Father God, that don't know you, Today, Father God, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Hollywood Community Church family. I'm so glad that you have chosen to worship with us online today. So did you ever have a teacher who treated one student differently than the rest? We would refer to that student as the teacher's pet. Uh, that student received special privileges and seemed to get more attention than the rest of the students. Or maybe at your place of work, there's one employee who gets preferential treatment. The management seems to cut that person more slack than anyone else, and they seem to get away with things that maybe you would never be able to get away with. Or just maybe you grew up in a home where one of the children was treated as the favorite. 
Hey, I don't know, maybe you were, maybe you are the favorite child in your home. Many of the Jews in New Testament times thought that way. They, they believed that as God's chosen people, they received unique privileges that others didn't deserve. Although, yes, God is wrathful and, and God was going to judge the pagan nations, they felt like God was extremely patient and kind with them. And that God was willing to overlook many of their minor transgressions. Many Christians today have the same mindset. We wouldn't admit that we have that mindset, but we've rationalized that we're the teacher's pet, that, that God looks on us with favor, and as a result, God will graciously and kindly overlook our sins, because our sins really aren't that bad in comparison to other people's sins. He'll overlook ours while he sternly judges the sins of others. That simply is not true. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul concludes the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today, Romans 2, verses 1 through 11, with one simple and yet straightforward verse. Let me read this verse, and then we'll have a word of prayer. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul says this, For God shows no partiality. Five simple words. For God shows no partiality. Would you pray with me today? Father, once again, as we look at your word, we pray that the Holy Spirit of God, the great teacher, would open our eyes open our minds, and open our hearts. Help us not just to understand this passage of Scripture, but help us to be willing to apply it to our lives. And so we thank you for what you are going to do through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll remember that last week the Apostle Paul dealt, dealt with some pretty deep stuff. If you remember, he talked about the fact that God demonstrates his wrath against those who suppress the truth, who reject his divine revelation, and those who fail to honor him. The Apostle Paul showed the digression of sin, the fact that sin never remedies itself. Sin never gets better. Sin always degenerates. And as a result of man's persistent pursuit of sin, Paul said three times in Romans chapter 1 that God gave them up. He, he allowed them to come to erroneous conclusions. He allowed them to follow after their sinful passions. And he allowed them to justify their sinful actions with a depraved mind. Now, if we're not careful, as we talked about last week, we can read those verses or hear that and, and kind of respond with an attaboy attitude, thinking that God is speaking to others and not to us. But that simply is not the case. We saw last week that the message of Romans chapter 1 wasn't directed to them. It is directed to us. And as we come to chapter 2, the Apostle Paul gives us three admonitions, simple admonitions, yet profound admonitions to remind us that God's view of our sin is no different. So, so the first admonition that Paul gives us in Romans chapter 2 is this, don't be a hypocrite. Notice chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Paul says this. We looked at it last week, but Paul says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and, that, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? 
In these verses, the Apostle Paul is chastising his fellow Jews for their judgmental attitudes towards the Gentiles. He's basically asking them, who do you think you are? You condemn the Gentiles, yet you practice the very same things. In essence, he's accusing them of hypocrisy, of being hypocrites. You see, we, just like the Jews, are experts at seeing the sins of others, but often blinded to our own faults and blinded to our own sins. It's kind of like looking at someone and telling them to wipe their face, and yet at the same time, we have chocolate dripping off of our chin. (laughs) Or it's like complaining about someone else's driving while I'm running a red light. Or it's kind of like one politician calling out the indiscretions of another politician. Or maybe a pastor preaching the gospel, but not living the gospel. Or maybe us condemning the unacceptable sins of others while making excuses for our acceptable sins. Because after all, my sins aren't as bad as somebody else's sins. Jesus addressed this truth in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Jesus said this, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, Jesus says. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So so here's what Paul is encouraging in Jesus as well. He said, let's not be a hypocrite. So, So how should we respond then? Let me give you two practical ways that we can live out what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. The first is this, be honest with your own sins. Let me say that again, be honest with your own sins. For some reason, it's really difficult for us to see our own weaknesses, our own faults, and our own sins. We can easily see them in the lives of others, but for some reason, it's difficult for us to see our own. It's kind of like, noticing dirt on your face. Unless you look in a mirror or someone tells you that your face is dirty, you might go all day long with dirt on your face and never know it. Several weeks ago, I came to to preach the Sunday morning message and to film it, and uh, I preached through the entire message and was really satisfied with it and went out to my car, and before I turned my car on, I, I was fixing my mirrors, and I noticed that I had a great big blood spot right on my chin. I'd gone through the entire message, and I didn't even look at my own face. I didn't know the blotch that I had on my face. If I would have only looked in the mirror before the message, I would have never had to preach the message all over again. So I had to come back, and we had to do the entire message all over again. That's a really practical truth. And applying that to our spiritual lives, unless you and I are looking at ourselves In the mirror of God's word, it is easy for us to overlook our sins while pointing out the sins of others. David the psalmist addressed this in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, where David said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. The Apostle Paul, in giving direction about the Lord's Supper, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, says this Let a person examine himself, and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. In verse 31 of that chapter, he says, But if we judged ourselves, truly we would not be 
judged. So, so can I give you a real practical application today? Let me encourage you to frequently examine your actions, examine your reactions, your attitudes, and your motives. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to do a heart check on you. Allow him the freedom to come in and, and to search you and you be sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. I promise you that he will point out anything in your life that doesn't please him. Be honest with your own sins. But I would give you a second admonition as we look at this passage, and it's this. Be forgiving towards the sins of others. I frequently hear people say that Christians can be some of the most unforgiving people. Why is that? The, the, those of us who have been forgiven the most have a tendency to be the most unforgiving. We, we should be the first ones to forgive. We should be the ones who forgive the greatest offenses. Yet sadly, often that is not the case. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable of a man who owed millions of dollars to a creditor. The creditor lost patience with the man because the man had delayed payment for years and years, and the creditor had lost patience with him, so the creditor comes and he threatens to throw him into jail. But the debtor falls down on his knees before the creditor, begs for just a little bit more time, and promises that he will pay all of the debt. The creditor was so moved by the man's sincerity and, and begging for forgiveness that the creditor forgave all of the debt. That same man who was who was just forgiven millions of dollars of debt, went out and in the parable, Jesus says that he went to a co-worker who owed him thousands of dollars. Nothing compared to what he had owed his creditor. And yet this man owed him thousands of dollars. He grabbed the man that owed him by the throat and demanded instant payment or he would throw him in jail. The original creditor, when he heard how the man whom he had forgiven responded was saddened, how he had responded with unforgiveness. That original debtor had him arrested. And in Matthew chapter 18, verses 32 and 33, as Jesus concludes the parable, that creditor looks at him and says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Oh, man, think with me today. We have been so forgiven by God. God has forgiven us a debt that we could never, ever have paid. And we are so grateful for that. As recipients of forgiveness, we should be the first to forgive. And so the Apostle Paul says, don't, don't be a hypocrite. Don't accuse others when we ourselves have sins in our lives that we need to deal with. There's a second truth that the Apostle Paul brings out here in Romans chapter 2. He says this, don't presume on God's kindness. Notice verses 4 and 5. Paul says this, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, knowing that the kindness or knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you were storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed." Once again, Paul begins verse 4 by saying, do you presume on the kindness and forbearance and patience of God? The NIV says it this way, don't show contempt for the riches of God's kindness. Here's what Paul is basically saying. He's asking, do you take the goodness of God lightly? Do you and I take God's kindness for granted? 
And Paul then gives us a description of God's character. So I would challenge you and I as we think through this and we apply, we apply it to our lives with this thought, know God's character. Paul, Paul mentions three distinct attributes of God's character in these verses. Let me take just a few moments and unpack them for you. The first thing that Paul says is this, that God is good. Our, our English word for God actually points us in that direction. Our English word for God comes from the Anglo-Saxon Anglo word, which meant good. In, in the mind of the Anglo-Saxons, God was not only the greatest of all beings, but God was the best of all beings. He was the source of all goodness. And so when the Anglo-Saxons looked for a word to describe God, the word that they came up with was good because God is good. James 1.17 says this, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God demonstrates his goodness to us. Why? Because he himself is good. He demonstrates his goodness through creation. He, he demonstrates his goodness through common grace. The sun rises on all of us. It rains on all of us. God demonstrates his goodness through his common grace, and he demonstrates his goodness through the proclamation of the gospel. God is good. Paul talks about a second attribute here. He says God is tolerant. The word that he actually uses in the ESV is the word forbearance. The word forbearance has the idea of holding back, delaying, pausing, and maybe demonstrating clemency to someone. The idea that Paul is conveying that is that God is extremely patient with us. The first and the best example, of course, is Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden. Remember, God had warned them that on the day that they ate of the forbidden fruit, they would die. Genesis 1, 17. But after they had eaten of the forbidden fruit and God came to Adam and Eve, he did not execute judgment immediately. He could have. He would have been completely justified in, in killing them, in wiping them out at that moment. They deserved death. But although they deserved death, they did not physically die at that moment. Why? Because God demonstrated forbearance with them. So it is with us. We sin, but God does not immediately implement the judgment we deserve. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that, that, that God doesn't punish us immediately after every sin we commit? No, he doesn't. He, he bears with us. He endures the offense to his holiness, and he points us to salvation and forgiveness, offering us forgiveness. God is tolerant. There, there's a third attribute of God that's here. It's that God is long-suffering. The word that Paul uses here is the word patient. He is patient with us. The, the first part of the Greek word that's used here for patience is, is our word macro, uh, indicating something big or something long, indicating that God puts up with our sins for a long time. He not only doesn't punish us immediately, but he is macro patient with us. He is macro long suffering with us. Charles Spurgeon, preaching on this passage, said that God's forbearance has to do with the magnitude of our sins, while God's patience has to do with the multiplicity of our sins. I mean, you would understand how God can be patient after we commit a sin once or twice or three times. But I know in my life, there's sins that I have committed over and over and over and over again. How does God respond to me? He responds with, kindness, with forbearance, and with patience. Know God's character. 
But, but here's what Paul is saying. We not only should know and appreciate God's character, but we should know and understand God's purpose. Why is God so kind with us? Why is he forbearing? Why is he patient? Is it because like the Jews thought that, that we are his favorites and he just lets us get away with these things? Now, Paul tells us here in verse four, let me read it once again. Paul says, why do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead to repentance? God is kind toward us, not just overlooking the events because we're his favorites or he just doesn't want to get his hands dirty with our offense. No, no, he, he is kind with us. He's patient with us for a purpose. He, he, he is wanting his kindness to push us towards repentance. And yet sadly, Instead of responding to God's kindness with confession and with repentance and a changed life, we often respond with callousness and not responding at all. How do we do that? Let me give you two ways that we respond incorrectly to God's goodness. First of all, we don't realize the magnitude of our sins. Let me say that again. We fail to realize the magnitude of our sin. I would remind you that any sin, however innocent we think it might be, offends a holy God. We have no right to categorize our sins. We have no right to excuse them or act as if our sins are more innocent than others. And let's be honest, we all have a tendency to do that. If we didn't, we wouldn't commit the same sins over and over again. But in our minds, we somehow justify and rationalize believing that our sins aren't that bad and God is going to overlook our sins. And we fail to realize how our sins, how my sin as innocent as Brian thinks it might be, how my sin offends a holy, righteous God. I would submit to you today that any sin should break our hearts knowing that we have offended a holy God. And yet we often don't respond that way. We presume on his kindness, thinking once again, He's not going to judge us immediately. And the second way that we presume on his kindness is not only do we not magnify or, or understand the magnitude of our sins, but we don't repent of our sins. Because we don't view our sins as that grievous, we ignore them. Presuming on the kindness of God, failing to repent and turn from them, as God desires for us to do. God, God, the Apostle Paul addresses his Jewish brothers and he says, don't presume on God's kindness towards you. Take advantage of his goodness and allow him to change your life. Well, I would submit to you today that God loves you and God is kind to you and God is patient with you, but he demonstrates those attributes for a purpose because he wants you to become more like him. Don't presume on his kindness. Paul says a third thing in the passage. The third thing is this, don't trust in your works. Notice verses six through 10, he says this, he will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, 
the Jew first and also the Greek. It seems as if Paul is saying that salvation is by good works. In other words, if you do good and persist in goodness, that you will be saved. And if you do evil and persist in that evil, that then you will be lost. Of course, we know that that is not what the Apostle Paul is saying. That's what Paul was saying in this passage. He would contradict what he says in other passages. So what is it exactly that the Apostle Paul is telling us? Two thoughts. You are saved by faith and not by good works. <laughs> That's consistent with Paul's message throughout Scripture. I'd remind you what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for he says, For you, or by, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. In other words, here's what Paul is saying. You and I can never be good enough. We can't be kind enough. We can't give enough. You can't forgive enough. You can't go to church enough. You and I can never be good enough. Here's what we need. We desperately need the grace of God. And so if you're watching today and you are attempting to earn your salvation through your goodness, let me commend you for your attempt. But the scripture teaches us very clearly that all of our good works are just as filthy rags in God's sight and we can never do good enough to please him. What we desperately need is the grace of God. You and I are saved by grace through faith and not by good works. What is Paul saying then in the passage when he says that God will render to each one according to their works? Here's what he's saying. Your good works demonstrate your faith. My good works demonstrate my faith. In other words, the changes God is making in your life, the, the changes that God is making uh, in your life so that you're kinder to others, your willingness to forgive, your, your generosity, those are all demonstrations of the faith you possess. When he says in verse 6, I read it a second ago, he will render to each one according to his works. Here's what Paul is saying. Your actions, your attitudes, your motives are actually a demonstration of which path you are on. Are you on the path of righteousness that leads to glory, honor, immortality, and, and eternal life? Are you walking the path of destruction that leads to wrath, tribulation, and distress. Here's what Paul is saying, that God desires to do a work of grace in your life. He desires not only to change your eternal destiny, but he desires to change your character and my character. And he desires to mold us into the character of Jesus. That's what the gospel does. And when we respond to the gospel by faith, that's the work that God does in our life. A few weeks ago, we talked about the power of the gospel and that it has power not just to change our, our eternal direction, but it has the power to help us overcome sin in our daily lives. And it helps us to change the direction of our lives. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let me ask you today, is God doing a work of grace in your life? I'm not asking if you're perfect, if, if you've reached sinless perfection, because none of us will. But is God doing a work of grace in your life? And it is evident that, that before you knew him, you were headed one direction, and now you are headed in a completely different direction. Here's what Paul says. Don't be like the religious elite of his day who thought they were God's favorites. 
No, your nationality, your social status, nor your religious heritage give you an inside favor with God. He ends the passage saying, for God shows no partiality. Let me end with just a few questions for thought. Would you think through and pray through these questions with me this morning? The first question is this. Have you recognized your guilt before God? You see, conviction of sin and understanding of our own depravity, our own sinfulness, is the starting point of our salvation. We can't turn to Jesus until we know that we desperately need him. That's why Paul is taking so much time in the beginning of this letter to point out our sinfulness. We desperately need Jesus. All of us are guilty before God. Have you recognized your guilt before God and turned to him? Here's the second question. Do you have a sense of spiritual elitism? You see, if we're not careful, we can forget where God has brought us from. The humility that we needed for salvation, if we're not careful after a few years, turns into spiritual pride, almost allowing us to have the sense of spiritual elitism that we are better than others. Our sins aren't as bad as theirs. God looks on us differently. Do you have a sense of spiritual elitism? If you do, would you confess that to God? Thirdly, are there any sins in your life that you have excused or ignored? Maybe sins that you've kind of tucked away and act like it's no big deal. And at this very moment, the Holy Spirit of God is, is, is pointing light on that sin. Don't presume upon God's kindness. Today, confess that sin. Repent of that sin and ask the Holy Spirit of God to help you to turn from that sin. And the last question is this, is God continually changing you? I'm not asking if he changed you in the past. I'm asking, is he changing you today? Allow the truth of the gospel to continue to mold you and shape you into who God wants you to be. Would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Help us this morning to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God as he speaks to us and help us to obediently respond to him. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father's arms 
of things. God, I put all my trust in you. God, I pray you just carry my burdens for me, take them away. Father, I thank you for the burdens of life, because without them, we would never run to you. God, I, I thank you for being just the comforter for us, as the Holy Spirit is always advocating for us. Father, we thank you for redeeming us and calling us your own. So Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us online. We can't wait to see you next week. And uh, yes, thank you so much, we love y'all. Have an amazing week. We're praying for you. We are here for you. And uh, yeah, we love you. See you next week. <laughs>